Anjana Shalakaya Chaksuran Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Namaham Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhaktivedanta Swamaniti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Koravani Precharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschacha Deshatarine Vancha Kaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Payevacha Patita Nam Pavanebio Vaishnavibio Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasati Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So welcome everyone to our ongoing study of the third canto Srimad Bhagavatam. We're at Kapila Shiksha, today chapter number 28. And this is, of course, for the, at the level of bhakti vaibhav. Okay, so who would like to share, please share with me something. What did you learn yesterday, Chandrika Maharaji? Sri Ram Nitai Prabhu can tell us something. You heard yesterday? Friendship with the Lord. So to develop the to friendship with the Lord, our uh, spiritual master was the external manifestation of the Paramatma. Yes, right. Spiritual master is the external manifestation of Paramatma. And we have to consider Paramatma as what? The best friend, right? Of course, Paramatma is also the proprietor, the supreme proprietor, the supreme enjoyer. We shouldn't think the spiritual master is the supreme proprietor, the supreme enjoyer. Right? We'd, we'd be challenged if the spiritual master tries to take the position of the supreme proprietor and the supreme enjoyer. It would be difficult. But we should think of him as a friend, yes. Our ever well wisher. Prabhupada used to say, right? He used to sign his letters, your ever well wisher. So that's the kind of friendship you want. Okay, thank you, Prabhu. Maharaj, may I say? Yes, please, Prabhu. Maharaj, one very interesting thing I learned yesterday uh, that uh, it is mixed devotional service when we are doing uh, the devotional service for even our personal spiritual benefit. And secondly, uh, the pure devotional service is only that service which we are rendering for satisfying Krishna. There is no material benefit, there is no spiritual benefit and there is no uh, tinge of any personal desires. It is only for the satisfaction and the happiness of Krishna. Yes, very nice. Thank you, Prabhu. Very nice. Very important point. Yes. Mm -hmm. We also uh, learned... Krishna. Yes, Prabhu? Yes? Yeah, I just want to say, Hare Krishna, please accept my humble assistance, obeisances. So I, I remember that uh, we spoke about bhakti, that is uh, like that di direct process, and... Uh, the, the the indirect process uh, we can also go to the Lord but if we doesn't go to the 
process of bhakti, we will be not success, successful. Right. And, and uh, also that the devotee is, uh, doesn't disturb by material, uh, uh, how to say, uh, circumstances. Uh, he is, uh, because he is engaged in the devotional service and therefore he is not touched by these circumstances with influencing Right. He can be in the material world but still be a liberated soul. Yes. Because his body, mind and words is all for the service of Krishna. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to go on today to chapter 28. Is everyone able to see? Yes, Hare Krishna Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj, can I make uh, one point? Sorry? Can I just make one point? Yes, please. You discussed. Uh, please accept Mahamura Bhinn's of Lord Srila Prabhupada. Maharaj, we spoke about uh, how did Arjuna give up his proprietorship. Uh, so we said uh, he, he followed Krishna's instructions. So we have to do what Krishna wants. And the second point, the cure for polluted consciousness is uh, dedicated devotional service. What was that point about dedicated devotional service? Yes, the cure for polluted consciousness is dedicated devotional service. Okay. Yes, the, the cure for polluted consciousness is dedicated devotional service. Right? Is that what you're saying? That's correct, Raj. Yes. Because the voice is breaking a little still. All right. Yes. And we spoke, all, the chapter also emphasizes about the, the contamination in the heart, which is due to Icha and Dvesha, the desire ourselves to be God and envious of God. And that desire to actually challenge Krishna, take Krishna's position. Okay, so we'll go ahead. Let's see. Slideshow. Yeah. All right, so Kapila's instructions on the execution of devotional service. First, the connection with the previous chapter. So in the previous chapter, it was recommended how the devotee must bring the mind under full control. Now, Lord Kapila will elaborate on the yoga system known as Astanga Yoga which is part of Vaishnava practice because its ultimate goal is to concentrate the mind on the Lord. So there's an interesting statement from Srila Prabhupada that Astanga Yoga is part of Vaishnava practice. Of course, what we see today, the, 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 the commercial form of Astanga Yoga is simply asanas and sometimes they get into pranayama but practically there's no mention about yam and, and niyama and there's no mention also about the pratyahara, dharna, dhyana and samadhi. They simply talk on the third level and the fourth level and they, uh, the asana and the pranayama. Pranayama is not much also. But Prabhupada explains here, this is Vaishnava practice. But it is meant to bring us to concentrate the mind on the Lord. So this is an important point. Bringing the mind under full control. That was emphasized in the previous chapter. So we're going to hear how we can do that through Astanga Yoga bringing the mind under full control. So the first section of the chapter, first 12 texts, describe the different limbs of Astanga Yoga, the preliminary yoga practice for attaining devotional service. And then goes in, chapter uh, slokas 13 to 18, will give the description of the Lord's form 
That's overall form, seeing the Lord as a whole. But 19 to 33, we'll hear about meditation on the individual limbs of the Lord. Now usually Prabhupada points out, he said, when people meditate on the Lord, they will meditate on the different limbs of the Lord. So first of all, they give the description of the overall form, and then you get the description of the individual limbs. Of course, beginning, beginning from the lotus, lotus feet. And then, at the end of the chapter, we'll hear about the results of fixed meditation on the Lord. So this is the overview of the chapter. Okay, so the first 12 texts. Would someone like to read for me, please? Not Kapila, personality of Godhead. Sorry, go ahead. Lord Kapila, personality of Godhead. He is the highest authority on yoga. He explains the yoga system known as the Stanga Yoga. Even Patanjali explains that the target of all yoga is Vishnu. Stanga Yoga is therefore part of Vaishnava practice because its ultimate goal is the realization of Vishnu. All right, so Patanjali is generally considered the Acharya in the yoga school. His, his famous book is the Yoga Sutras. And the Yoga Sutras generally, is, it's a lot of impersonalism with a little glimmer of Vishnu there. <laughs> a little, a little bit. <laughs> it's not very clear. It's like Patanjali was almost afraid to, to actually reveal the truth. And he speaks more about the impersonal aspects. But Patanjali Yoga Sutras is popular. Okay, there's a bit more, yes. And go ahead Prabhu, keep reading. Okay. The achievement of success in yoga is not a position of mystic power, which is condemned in the previous chapter but rather freedom from all material designations and situation in one's constitutional position. That is the ultimate achievement in yoga practice. Yes, in the previous chapter, I think it's in the final text of the chapter, Srila Prabhupada talks about the byproducts of yoga. Does anyone know what the byproducts of yoga are? Yeah, uh, Siddhis, uh, the mystic, uh, mystic achievements like uh, to become smaller than the smallest, larger than the largest, yes. heavier than the heaviest, lighter than the lightest. Yes, yes, very good, right. That's the byproducts, right? <laughs> we're, not we're, not, we're not concerned about the byproducts. We're interested what's the real goal, the ultimate achievement in yoga practice. What are we trying to achieve? And what we really want to achieve is to concentrate the mind, fix the mind on Lord Vishnu. A Prabhupada mentions here, he said, freedom from all material designations and situation in one's constitutional position. Freedom from all material designations, that's something similar to Rupa Goswami's definition of pure devotional service, where he talks about uh, upadi, sarvupadi vinirmuktam, tatparatvena nirmalam, rishikesha rishikena sevanam bhaktir uchate. Right? Sarvupadi vinirmuktam, upadi, upadi means designations. So here is also mentioned by Prabhupada in this purport to the first verse, freedom from all material designations and situation in one's constitutional position. In other words, we should know what is our actual situation, our position in relation to Vishnu. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu taught us, 
Jivarasvarupahai Nitya Krishna Das, that we are all Krishna Das, we are all servants of Krishna. That is our constitutional position. So that is the ultimate achievement in yoga practice. Okay, here's a little exercise which you can do. How many people do we have here in the class today? Seventeen. Uh, minus two, fifteen, uh, Maharaj. Fifteen? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so we, you can have one group of three and then there'll be pairs. Seven, uh, no, that means seven groups. Okay. Right? So you want to discuss, for every item in the yoga system, there is a parallel activity in bhakti yoga. But the practice of bhakti yoga is easier for this age. That's from text 11, purport. So we want you to identify the yoga practices prescribed in this section. First 12 verses. You have to identify the yoga practices and then discuss how each of them has a parallel in bhakti yoga. All right? You have to look at the text, the yoga practices which are prescribed. And then what is the parallel in bhakti yoga? Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, can I ask a question, please? All right, please. Just regarding our previous discussion, uh, the previous chapter, the last verse, where it says that the yogi uh, wants to achieve, uh, become smaller than the smallest or greater than the greatest, or even create their own planet. Uh, now, when one achieves this, is it a gradual elevation to the part of bhakti, or if one desires this as a yogi? No, 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 no. It's mentioned they're byproducts of yoga. One does not desire these. They don't. Okay. The yogi doesn't desire them. The real goal of yoga, Prabhupada explained, freedom from all material designations and understanding our constitutional position. Okay. These, are, the, these, yo these yoga powers, these are not de desired. You know, but it's understood that pure devotees, very great devotees, they will have these powers, but they won't show them. They won't use them. I see. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, but just as a by question, uh, by the way, question, if one does desire this and they achieve it, do they get the result of karmic reaction? Well, it depends how they use it. If they desire, you desire something, that's a material desire. Then, then certainly you're going to get some kind of reaction for it. You desired it, you're going, it means you, you want to use it, you're going to do something with it. And you do, you do something, you get something from someone, you get, you've got karma, you're indebted to them, you have to pay them back, <laughs> right? You take something from someone, just like Indra took blessings from people to get rid of his sinful reactions. So you ha we have to be very careful about taking things from other people. It becomes an obligation. You have to pay them back. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you very much. All right. So we'll, we'll just give you five minutes to think about these things. See if you can come up with some answers. We have to do this exercise in groups or individually, Maharaj? You're in, you should have a partner. But we are not in a, having a group actually, we are all individually. Oh, okay, so it's n nobody's here to put you into pairs, so I don't know how to do no, it. No, uh, uh, shall I create a group, Maharaj? Yeah, pairs, right. We want seven. There should be like, there's 15 here, so uh, yeah. you, 
Seven groups. Okay, I'm going to create. And how many minutes, uh, Maharaj? Seven. And, no, and how many? Huh? And how Maharaj, which, uh, sorry to interrupt, which group has to do which uh, text number? You all have, you have to do the whole thing. You, each of okay. you have. Okay, Maharaj, I'm creating. Eh? It's for five minutes? Or yes, seven, five minutes. Five minutes. Yeah. Five minutes. Okay. Chandrika Maharaji, are you there? Hare Krishna Maharaj, I don't... I don't know why I'm with... Um, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Uh, group with you. <laughs> yes? Are you familiar with the text? Have you looked at the text? No, I didn't have time yesterday, Maharaj, I'm sorry. Uh -huh. It's... So I have to read it. So there are 12 texts. You don't have to read all 12. You just look through the text. You don't need the purport. Just see the text. The main points okay. are in the text. Okay. So? You can read text number... So you read the text, pick out the ones, what ones you think you can do in bhakti. What has a, what's a parallel activity in bhakti? Just like asanas, mm -hmm. yoga asanas. What do we do? Any asanas in bhakti? Do we get um, any? Do you get any? We, huh? Maybe when we chant Hare Krishna. Why? Yeah, you j j jump and jump up and down, dance back and forward, and also offer obeisances, mm -hmm. right? That's asanas. What about praja pranayama, breathing? Do you get breathing exercise? And when we dance also. Huh? When we chant and when we dance also. When you chant, right, when you do your chanting, yeah, pranayama. What about uh, the austerities that the, the, they have regulations in yoga, the yoga practice, yama niyam, do we have that in bhakti yoga? Yes, of course, we have four regulators. Right, principles yes, and right. Yes. To chant 16 rounds. Yes. Minimum. Yeah. And what about Meditation on the Lord. Of course, we uh, read about the Lord, about his pastimes. We discuss Shriman Bhagavatam. Meditation on mantra, meditation on uh, Archa Vigraha. Yes, the, the deity worship, right? The deity worship, that is where we meditate on the Lord more. Mm -hmm. Yes. Meditation on the form of the Lord and the deity worship. Uh -huh. Okay, so you can see the parallels, the different activities. All right. 
Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. I think I think we can close the groups, bring everybody back. Okay, uh, it will take uh, uh, 10 seconds, sir. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Okay, everyone's back? Yes, much. We're back. Yes, much. Oh, good. Okay, so? What? I heard you're unaudible. I'm not audible? I'm not muted. He's audible to everyone else, I think. Yes, I can hear also. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so? Have you got some answers? What are some parallel activities in Bhakti Yoga and in Astanga Yoga? Recording in progress. The first verse, Maharaj, speaks about um, the yogi's objective is to concentrate the mind. So we have that opportunity to achieve that every time we chant Japa. That's, that, that, um, that's what we're trying to do. So that's covered there just by a vow to chant the holy name. So to concentrate the mind. So that's okay. okay. Very good. Yes. We concentrate the mind. We concentrate our mind by chanting the holy name. The Ashtanga Yogi, how do they concentrate the mind? I think it's, it mentions later by meditating upon the form of Vishnu. Yeah, maybe silent meditation, yes. Yeah, yeah. Ashtanga is silent meditation. All right. Somebody else? Let's hear something else. Uh, yeah, Maharaj, may I speak? Please. Yeah, uh, second and second to fourth basically refers to the yam and niyam. Yam basically corresponds to the uh, don'ts and niyam corresponds to the do's of devotional service. So don'ts are basically the four regulative principles like no meat eating, no illicit sex, no gambling and no intoxication. And uh, the uh, do's is basically uh, doing the chanting of regular chanting of 16 rounds uh, without any offense. Yes. Any other things we do? We're supposed like to... Shra yeah, Shravanam and Kirtanam and then doing deity worship and then doing Vaishnav Seva. Okay, yeah, many things, right. Okay, thank you, Prabhu. Yes? Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj go uh, ahead. Yeah, I think so. Uh, like, like, we, uh, like we do Swa Dharma Charanam. In that we have these material body, uh, there are various duties prescribed. Like uh, the system is divided into four orders, social orders, uh, Brahmana, Khatriya, Vaishya and Shudra. So uh, in this, it means uh, one must discharge the prescribed duties of the particular division of society faithfully to the best of their ability. So it is parallel to Bhakti as uh, like everyone in this, they should do it, uh, they should do their prescribed duties as um, in order to serve the Lord. So, uh, like, in order to serve the Lord, that is the main execution of Swadharma. Hmm. Uh, this, I mean... Uh, so you're saying everyone, everyone's, all, all the devotee in Bhakti Yoga, they're all on the spiritual platform. No, so, uh, I mean, all the, I mean, all the system, every, everything like Brahmana, Khatriya, Vaishya, Shubha should follow their duties in order to serve the Lord. That is their actual duty. To, uh, to become advanced in Krishna consciousness. 
But we don't have that in Krishna consciousness. We don't have Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Sudra. We don't divide people like that. Everyone is servant of Krishna. Yes, that's what I mean. I mean, they should, everyone should aim in one, I mean, to serve the Lord. All right. Everyone should serve the Lord. Yes, that's right. Because devotees are all engaging in bhakti yoga. They're on the transcendental platform. We're not following Varnashram Dharma like that. We don't divide the devotees, Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Sudra. We do whatever is necessary. Sometimes you have to clean the toilet, sometimes you have to worship the deity, sometimes you cook. There's so many different duties to be done. You have to keep accounts. <laughs> we have to do everything. Not everything. Probably. Yes, sir. Yes? Uh, my main aim is that they should, uh, that's what I said, everyone should aim in uh, serving the Lord. Okay, yes. And do they do that also? That's also there in uh, Astanga Yoga, huh? Yes, Maharaj. They're also serving the Lord. They, they do a course according to Varnashra. They have their, their duty according to Varnashra. Yes, yes, Maharaj. Okay. Right, someone else? Marari Prabhu, have you got any point? Yes, Maharaj. Uh, in the text 5, it was about when one must observe sil silence. So in Krishna consciousness, we we are practic practicing in, in that way that uh, we are not speaking anything expect, expect Krishna consciousness. So we are, we are glorifying the Lord and uh, speaking about uh, the devotional service, devotees and like this. Oh, okay. Yeah, how did Prabhupada describe silence? Prabhupada, Prabhupada says, silence is the chanting of Hare Krishna. <laughs> he, said, he said, that is silence, that is real silence, when you're chanting Hare Krishna. Okay, so the parallel is there, all right. Sriman Nitai Prabhu? No, you had your hand up, you already answered, yeah? Yes. Uh, in Vasudhara, it, it, it talks about <coughs> always residing in a secluded place. Sorry? Uh, so in Vasudhara, always residing in a secluded place. Sorry? It talks about always residing in a secluded place. Oh. So how do we do that in Bhakti Yoga? So, so in, in Bhakti Yoga, we always uh, talk about uh, living in holy places. Living, living in holy places. Okay. Yes. With the association of devotees. Yes. Right. Okay. Thank you. Hare Krishna. And then also, Ratha Sri. Who is it? Can't read. I have to put my glasses on. <laughs> okay. Uh, Rao Shekhar Das. Hare Krishna, Mujer. Hare Krishna Maharaj Ji, uh, uh, we, we have been in group and we have divided uh, three persons uh, and so I mean uh, for last four verses and verse number 11 they have talked about Pranayan and they say that by concentration of mind one is free from sins and free from three modes of material nature. So by doing the Krishna consciousness we are, uh, we are at the transcendental level. We are also, uh, uh, when we do pure devotional service, we uh, we can elevate ourselves at the transcendental level. <clears throat> and verse number 12, they say, you have to concentrate on the nose. This means you have to close your eyes half closed, so you can, we can do chanting in a better way. Not uh, If we close the eyes, then we can And if we open eyes fully, then we just talk about Okay, thank you, Prabhu. Yes, we, generally when we talk about pranayama, we think the, the, the parallel activity in bhakti yoga, we, we, we think it more might be chanting Hare Krishna. Of course, 
Prabhupada, they say there, by doing pranayama, you destroy sin. So chanting Hare Krishna also destroys sin. Same effect. But chanting Hare Krishna is very quick. Pranayama, do pranayama, you take a long time. But chanting Hare Krishna, you have to also breathe. There's some regulation there in the breathing, chanting Hare Krishna. All right, what about the asanas? What's the parallel activity in bhakti yoga? Nobody told me the parallel activity for asanas. Kirtan, Raj, isn't it? Huh? Kirtan. Kirtan. Well, well so, sometimes you just sit down and do kirtan. Is that, is that asana? Yeah, that's an asana as well, isn't it? Okay. If you sit properly, sit like a yogi, yeah. And if, you, if you're dancing, then you get a lot of exercise, yes, yeah, good. Anything else for asanas? I thought offering obeisances. Give a, we give obeisances. You go into the temple room, you give obeisances, you offer a flower, you give obeisances. We meet devotees, we bow down to each other. We do a lot of obeisances, especially if you go in the Holy Dham, you go around the holy places, we give obeisances to the trees and so many things. So offering obeisances is one way of doing our, our asanas, parallel activity. Yes? Yes, uh, could you say also sitting down and doing deity worship, for example? Sit down and do deity worship? Yes. Yes. Okay. But what is the purpose of deity worship? And when we sit down to do deity worship, then we concentrate the mind. We have to concentrate the mind that we're giving personal service to the Lord. The Lord is personally there in the deity. So contemplating the Lord, that is also there in the Stanga Yoga the meditation on the Lord. So we do that through the deity worship. So in this way you can see the parallel between the different activities. Okay, is everybody okay with this? Okay, well. Okay, Maharaj, what will be the, for Pratyahara and Dharana? Pratyahara and Dharana, well they're stages of meditation, right? Prachahara is internalizing everything, In, not looking at the external objects, but internalizing, internalizing one's consciousness, contemplating within. So in Bhakti Yoga, we would contemplate, we could contemplate ourselves as, as, as a spirit soul, understanding we're not the body, detachment from the material body, right? Controlling the senses is controlling the senses is certainly there in bhakti yoga. He has to control the senses. Of course, our process of controlling the senses is to use the senses in the service of Krishna, rather than stopping the senses. We want to use the senses in the service of Krishna. Okay, so pratyahar, dharna, and dhyan they will basically uh, correspond to uh, basically uh, having. The meditation on the uh, Supreme Lord. Yes, I think so. And Samadhi also, Maharaj? Well, Samadhi, fixed mind, right? Fixed mind. You can be in Samadhi. Work, work now, Samadhi now, right? <laughs> we can be in Samadhi, just distributing Prabhupada's books and chanting Hare Krishna. You can be in Samadhi. We can be in Samadhi, cooking for Krishna. Devotees in Samadhi everywhere. Don't, we don't have to just sit down in Samadhi. We can be active in the service of Krishna and be in Samadhi. The mind is fixed on Krishna. We're doing it for Krishna, for Krishna's pleasure. So that is Samadhi, fixed mind. Yes, Maharaj. Okay. So, all right, we'll come back to the PowerPoint here. Here you can see we've mentioned the different stages. Would someone like to read them for me, please? Somebody 
can read first yama niyam uh, yama non violence truthfulness not stealing not accepting more than necessary celibacy and silence niyama follow one's duties of varnashram avoid forbidden duties constant thought of liberation eat pure food in moderate quantities live in a secluded and peaceful place austerity cleanliness study of vedas and worship of the supreme lord yes good right so this this is what you get actually if you check in the uh, patanjali yoga sutras these things are all mentioned there and the, because patanjali yoga sutras are talking about this astanga yoga and these these points are all mentioned there very similar just different language but same same meaning all right then pranayama someone read read pranayama and the benefit control the breath purify the passage for prana by practice of kumbhaka puraka and rachaka so that the mind becomes steady and pure right kumbhaka that's talking about the different stages of breathing one is inhaling one is exhaling and rechaka is keeping the keeping the, the the mind keeping the air empty keeping the you not not breathing at all so one is inhaling one is exhaling and one is not breathing at all different stages of the passage of the prana so we, this is pranayama Prabhupada would often refer to the pranayama as the nose pressing yoga the nose pressing yoga because you, you 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 put your thumb on one side of the nose and press the nostril and breathe in the other nostril right and then what you do then you release it and then you press on the other side of the nose and then breathe in the other nostril like that so Prabhupada goes the nose pressing yoga pranayama and the benefit the doshas of the body are destroyed the doshas doshas mean the faults right the impurities in the body are destroyed do you have any doshas doshas the faults all right go ahead prajahara someone read withdraw the senses from material objects and turn them towards the heart using the mind benefit association with sense objects is destroyed right association with the sense objects is destroyed because you're not looking at things around you you're looking within so this is described in bhagavad gita in different places krishna talks about how the yogi contemplates within it feels peaceful contemplating within is not thinking about what's around him so this pratyahara turning away from the world for a devotee of course we don't turn away from the world we just use it for krishna just a difference remember the example the rose Okay go ahead Dharana someone read fix the prana at one spot among the various chakras by the mind meditate on the supreme lord by looking at the tip of the nose benefit benefits sins are destroyed okay so dharana fix the prana right that prana that energy that air which is within at one spot among the various chakras by the mind there's different chakras in the body right we have we have i think is it six different chakras in the body we begin from the navel up going up to the top of the head so you can fix on one of the chakras and fix the prana there then meditate on the supreme lord by looking at the tip of the nose not very not very inspiring is it look at the tip of the nose it's so nice to look at the deities you look at the tip of the nose it's not 
All right, then dhyana, meditation. Dhyana, meditation on the individual limbs of the Lord and on the pastimes of the spiritual world. Benefit, uncontrollable qualities are destroyed. Yes. So, in the big, when you do the meditation, you should meditate on the individual limbs, right? You begin from the lotus feet and then gradually it can move up. And go ahead, Samadhi, one more, who would like to read? Samadhi, then he attains Samadhi of the mind. When the mind becomes detached from all material objects, the mind suddenly gets destroyed. Having destroyed the misconceptions of his body, he sees his Atma without covering. Thus, he is situated in his own position, beyond happiness and distress. Jai, this is Samadhi. Mind becomes detached from all material objects. Mind suddenly gets destroyed. Destroyed the misconception of the body. He sees the Atma, sees the soul without coverings. We don't have the body anymore. We got rid of the body. We got rid of the gross body and the subtle body. And he's situated in his own position, his spiritual position. All right, here you can see di nice diagram given by Patanjali, Yoga Sutras. Now well, you can see the different stages, Yam, Niyam, Asan, Pranayam, Prajahara, Dharna, Dhyana, Samadhi. All right, this is from Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> Okay, we'll go ahead. We're going to look at this next section, 13 to 18, description of the Lord's form. Identified. Yes. Sorry, my apologies, Maharaj. I, I just have a question uh, since we went through that list. Uh, can I ask? Okay. Yeah. Maharaj, you know, going through through that list, it kind of made me think about uh, two things. Devotees, uh, I know of devotees, uh, even senior devotees, sometimes practice this breathing exercises or they do uh, this one form of healing called Reiki for their body, which they say helps them, you know, in terms of keeping the body healthy so that they can perform the devotional service. What do they call it? Reiki? Reiki healing. Reiki, yes, yeah. Some form of. And I know even at our medical center, because at our one temple we have, uh, you know, different aspects. Uh, and one aspect is medical center where they offer Reiki healing and meditation to the public. So I wanted to know Maharaj's thoughts on, you know, devotees practicing these type of things. Ultimately, the intention is to have a stronger body to serve Krishna. Just one other thing I wanted to mention, like when we do the Bhakti Yoga Society programs at universities, uh, you know, to attract students to the classes, the devotee would come first, do some yoga and breathing, and then we would have a talk on Krishna consciousness and then a bit of kirtan. So it's kind of a draw card using this aspect to draw people in. So I want to know Maharaj's thoughts on those two things, devotees being and then also attracting people using this as a tool to attract new people. Well, it's up to every individual, you know, there is variety. There is some variety there in Krishna consciousness. Uh, we often use yoga ourselves to attract people. When I first went into China, we were using yoga to attract people. Even today, a lot of our yoga, pre a lot of our preaching is done in yoga studios. We don't off we don't do the yoga ourselves, but we introduce them to kirtan. We simply introduce the kirtan. We go to the and the kirtan. Our kirtan is very popular in yoga studios all over the world. If someone's a good kirtanier, he, he, he will be often invited to yoga studios to perform kirtan and bring the bhajan band or the kirtan band along to the yoga studio and do kirtan for all the yogis. And so it, it's a nice place to preach. People are generally in the mode of goodness. 
they're open-minded and willing to hear about Krishna and you know, they enjoy the kirtan. So we're not against yoga. As, as it says here, the Astanga Yoga is part of the Vedic culture, but the whole purpose of it is to bring people to contemplate in Lord Vishnu. And so if you can bring people to Vishnu, to Krishna consciousness by it, then good. Reiki, I, you know, well, if people use it, they have to go out on book distribution, they have to work for Krishna. If the Reiki is helping them, certainly better than taking a lot of Western medicine. Yeah. Leave it to the individual. Everyone has to deal with their own body. We all have our own bodies and we have problems. We have to deal with the body, the different needs of the body, what's required to keep the body fit and healthy. So if Reiki helps them to keep going in devotional service, I don't think it's a big problem. Just, you know, of course, you should understand it's material, it's not spiritual. Okay. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Hare, Krishna, Hare Krishna Maharaj, one small point may I uh, ask regarding the previous slide which you were discussing regarding Samadhi. Yes. Uh, Maharaj, very interestingly, you said that when we are uh, doing Srila Prabhupada uh, book distribution, when we are doing DT worship, whenever we are engaged in the service of the Lord, we are to be considered in Samadhi. And uh, Samadhi is a very beautiful stage where mind is uh, dissolved and one can see his Atma. But how to understand that when I have been distributing the books or doing some service, I am not able to see Atma or I am not able to dissolve my mind because my mind is a troublesome entity. Well, you have to understand, you have to see through the eyes of scriptures. Real vision is not just using your eye, your, your physical eye, but real vision is to see through the eye of the scriptures. And so you can see the Atma through the eye of the scriptures. That's good. Okay, Maharaj, and how to understand the dissolution of the mind, because mind is the biggest culprit. Well, we use the mind, we can use the mind to elevate ourselves also. Okay, Maharaj. It's how we use the mind. Everything depends on the attitude. If you're, if you're in control of your mind, you can use it to elevate yourself, to be Krishna conscious. Thank you so much, Maharaj. We use the mind to think of Krishna, to remember Krishna. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you so much, Maharaj. All right, text 13 to 18, description of the Lord's form. Uh, we want, uh, maybe we'll, we'll just read these texts ourselves. Let's go, th go to the, let's, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go to the text and read them ourselves, 13 to 18. We can read them together. Okay, text number 13 to 18. Let's see. 12, 13, yes. Would someone like to read 13 for us? The Supreme Personality of Godhead has a cheerful, lotus-like companions with ruddy eyes. Yes, ruddy eyes. Like the interior of a lotus and the swarthy body like the petals of a blue lotus. He bears a conch, discuss and mace in three of his hands. All right, so that's a description of the form of the Lord. Mm. In the purple, I marked a little section, I'll just read it to you. Those who are attracted to the impersonal or void features of meditation have to undergo a difficult process because we are not accustomed to concentrating our minds upon anything impersonal. Actually, such concentration upon anything imp uh, actually such concentration is not even possible. Bhagavad Gita also confirms that one should concentrate his mind 
on the personality of Godhead. All right, so we're hearing about the form of the personality of Godhead. We should be conversant. What does the Lord look like? What is his form? So text 14 goes on. Someone please read text 14. His lines are covered by a shining cloth, yellowish like the filaments of a lotus. On his breast, he bears the mask of Srivatsa, a girl of white hair. The brilliant uh, Kastava gem is suspended from his neck. All right, so some of the unique features on the body of the Lord, the Srivatsa mark and the Kastuba gem, they're not found on anybody else. That's how we can recognize the Lord. In Vaikuntha, if you go to Vaikuntha, there are many people with four arms and they all have, many have a Swarupya Mukti, they have forms similar to the Lord, but they don't have Srivatsa or Kastuba. That's how you know who is the Lord. Right? Go ahead, text 15, someone else read. He also wears around his neck a garland of attractive silent flowers and a swan of bees intoxicated by, intoxicated by its delicious fragrance comes about the garland. He is further superbly adorned with a pearl necklace, a crown and a pair of armlets, braces and antlers. All right. So we're hearing about the description of the Lord. The, first of all, he has a garland. And then the purport, Prabhupada explains about the nature of the flowers which are on the garland of the Supreme Lord. He says they're always fresh. Could you imagine that? The flowers are always fresh. Oh, it's so wonderful. You get f fresh flowers all the time. They don't decay because they're spiritual. So they retain their originality. They never fade. Very wonderful. I don't know what they do with all the flowers. They never fade. <laughs> we, you know, we, we always throw in so many flowers after they get a little old, a day old, they have to throw them away and get new flowers every day, change the flowers. But in the spiritual world, the flowers are always fresh. Everything. Oh, this is Prabhupada's purport. Everything taken from everything remains everything. Or, as has been stated in the spiritual world, one minus one equals one. And one plus one equals one. All right, who can explain this for me? Who's going to explain this for me? Everything taken from everything remains everything. How is it possible? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Uh, uh, let me try. Maharaji, uh, so Krishna expands himself as a Balram, but Krishna still remains the same. Then Balram expands again in Chatur form, and Balram still remains. So one minus one equal to one. Uh. Hare Krishna Maharaj, can I give Yes, a, please. Uh, go ahead, Maharaj. Like, like in an ocean, if you take out a drop from the ocean, then also the ocean remains. I mean, you will call it, uh, ocean remains the same. That way. Hmm. Yes. Okay. So, Krishna plus everything is equal to? Krishna. Krishna plus everything is equal to? Krishna. Krishna, right. And Krishna minus everything is equal to? Krishna. Yes. We call this spiritual mathematics. Right? Go ahead, text number 16. Read. Science and he's encircled by a cradle. He stands on the lotus of his devotee's heart. He is most charming to look at, and his serene expect gladdens the eyes and souls of the devotees who behold him. Yes. Yes, Krishna's all attractive feature is being described. Krishna is very, very attractive. His exquisite beauty. 
Right? That's one of Krishna's very special qualities. The, even Mahavishnu, even the Lord as Mahavishnu wants to see Krishna. Right? Do you know that pastime? Yes, Maharaj. What happened? Actually, there was a poor Brahmin and he was basically uh, challenging Arjun that he was uh, basically whenever his wife was delivering a child, the child could not be traced out. So Arjun, because of his valor and his courage, he was boasting that, okay, this time I will put a, a, a port of, fortress of arrows so that to see that nobody steals your child whenever he is born. But he was unsuccessful. So and then Lord Krishna, uh, he actually sympathized with Arjuna and took him to Mahavishnu and Mahavishnu then later revealed that he wanted to have the darshan of Krishna. That is why he was stealing all the children, newborn children of Brahman. Yes, right. Very good. Yes, you've got it. Right. Mahavishnu wanted to see Krishna and Arjuna. He took away the kids. So even your Mahavishnu, even your, your the, the Lord of Vaikuntha, he wants to see Krishna. All right? Text 17. Read. The Lord is eternally very beautiful and he is worshipable by all the inhabitants of every planet. He is ever youthful and always eager to bestow his blessings upon his devotees. Right. He's ever youthful. Oh, that's very nice, huh? <laughs> Must be nice. And he's worshipable by all the inhabitants of every planet. Even Lord Brahma, and the topmost planet in the universe, is worshipping Krishna. And Lord Shiva, the powerful, the most powerful of the demigods, they chant the names of Krishna and they worship Krishna. And Lord Krishna is always youthful and he gives blessings to his devotees. People like blessings. Right? If the deity is giving blessings, then they get many people come to the deity. So Krishna is always giving blessings. He likes to bless his devotees. But Krishna is cautious about what kind of blessings he will give to the devotees. Right? What kind of blessings? Will Krishna just give any material blessing to his devotee? No, Maharaj. What blessing will he give them? So that they can advance in devotional service. Right. He will give them the blessing to help them have more faith to come to Krishna. All right. Text 18. The glory of the Lord is always worth singing, for His glories enhance the glories of His devotees. One should therefore meditate upon the Supreme Personality of Godhead and upon His devotees. One should meditate on the external, on the excuse me, on the eternal form of the Lord, until the mind becomes fixed. Mm. Okay, I marked a little bit of the purport here. The same purpose is served when a devotee worships the form of the Lord in the temple. There is no difference between devotional service in the temple and meditation on the form of the Lord, since the form of the Lord is the same, whether he appears within the mind or in some concrete element. So we may question, what's better? Is it better to worship in the temple or better to worship within the mind? So there's different processes. All right, we'll go back to our slideshow. Let's see, where, okay. Okay, we covered this text, text 18. The next step.
Yes, list the eight kinds of forms recommended for the devotees to see. So deity can be made from these different elements, the eight different elements which are allowed for making a deity from. Sand, clay, wood, stone, they may be contemplated within the mind, jewels, metal, painted colors. All the forms are of the same value. So, of course, we have deities like Lord Jagannath, he's a Darudra Murti, right? Darudra, what? Darudra Murti, the form of Daru Brahma, Daru Brahma, thank you, Prabhu, yeah, Daru Brahma, Daru Murti, or the form of Lord Jagannath in wood, and then we have deities in stone, like marble. We have many marble deities, particularly Radha Krishna. And then metal, we have brass deities like Gornitai usually, and sometimes Radha Krishna, Panchatattva, they're made from the Asta metal, eight metals mixed together. But deity can also be painted colors. You can paint pictures and worship that, it can be, and Krishna can appear there. But it can also be in the mind. Clay, we see a lot of the artisans here in Bengal, they make the deities of the, they make a clay, a clay, they use clay to make different idols for Saraswati Puja or Kali Puja, Durga Puja, they will use clay to make the deity. So these different items are all authorized by the scriptures. Now, Sometimes we do see that they do things, they use things like resin to make something. Now, the resin, we don't see that here. You don't see, re you know, like you get things from China, they're made in China, resin dolls of Krishna. They're not really deities. People may use them, they may take them and put them on the altar and may worship them, but they're not the actual authorized deity form. It should be one of these eight elements. Jewels. If you have some nice jewels, then it's possible also put the jewels in the form of a deity or one big jewel or something may be carved as a deity. Okay. So these are the different elements which can be used for making deities. Maharaj, may I ask a question? Okay, go ahead. Um, also today, uh, sometimes uh, I see um, deities made of fiberglass. So I believe that is also uh, not in the recommended list. Yeah, I don't see it here, do you? Yeah, fiberglass. Mm -hmm. Because I'm not sure which Fiberglass is, a, is some transformation of, uh, of um, uh, a mixture of some things together, maybe. Yes, yeah. yeah, some it is some industrial process. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we don't. We, we wouldn't use that as an authorized deity. You may use it yourself. You may like to use it yourself in your own home, but we wouldn't really have it installed in a temple, fiberglass. But we, but you notice Prabhupada, now Prabhupada in the temple is different. When we put Prabhupada in the temple, Prabhupada, actually when they put Prabhupada in the temple, they don't really do a, an installation like what we do for the deities. It's not like we put life into the murti of Prabhupada in the temple room as we do. We put life in the deities, we invite Krishna into the deities. We don't do that for Prabhupada, for the spiritual teachers. It's not like that. It's different. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj, sorry, can I ask a quick question regarding that? Okay. I know here when they did an installation, uh, sorry, when they brought to the Prabhupada 80, 
they did an installation ceremony. Even every year on Prabhupada Vyasa Puja, a full Abhishek is done. So then, if life doesn't come into the deity of Prabhupada, so how do I, we understand that you know, we've been created to the Prabhupada deity and how does the reciprocation then take place? Well, just simply by the devotion of the devotees. It's not that, you, you know, although we, of course, we would do like that, we'd do the Abhishek and certainly we'd see Prabhupada is there, but it's, at the same time, it's, there's a distinction how the Prabhupada's sitting there and sitting. Now, Prabhupada on the altar is different. We put Prabhupada on the altar there with the deities, that's going to be a different thing. But Prabhupada sitting outside in the temple room, the way I the way I see it there is different. There's some difference there, you know. The Prabhupada's outside sitting there in the temple room. It's not quite the same as on the altar. But I did hear, I remember hearing from the devotees that they were talking about that when you put Prabhupada there, it's not, it's not like installing a deity. You don't, you don't have the installation thing the way we would for the deity. We invite Krishna to appear there. But Prabhupada would appear simply by our own devotion. We all feel Prabhupada's presence there. Each and every individual devotee will feel the presence of Srila Prabhupada. And uh, we offer our respects to Prabhupada and we, we see Prabhupada there every day. We do the, the Guru Puja every day. We have the feeling and that way it helps us to be conscious of Prabhupada. But it, it still is, there's some distinction between the spiritual teacher and, and the, the Supreme Lord. That you put the you put the spiritual master out there in the temple room and put him on the vyasa sun, it's going to be it's not it's a different thing from having the deities on the altar. It's a different level. That was how I was told about it anyway from people who are in in deity worship. We can hear more about this from Janani Vas Prabhu. I will talk to him about this again, just to confirm that, that I heard right. Thank you, Maharaj. All right, so the chapter moves into contemplating the individual limbs of the Lord. And we begin from the lotus feet of Lord Krishna, right? So, let's go through them together. We can go back to the text. Uh, or maybe you like to do them yourself. You know, you have, we have seven groups, right? And there are... Oh, what happened? Okay, so let's, re let's read the verses here. Text 19 says, They always, thus always merged in devotional service, the yogi visualizes the Lord standing, moving, laying down or sitting within him. For the pastimes of the Supreme Lord are always beautiful and attractive. Text 20. In fixing his mind on the eternal form of the Lord, the yogi should not take a collective view of all his limbs, but should fix the mind on each individual limb of the Lord. All right. Group number one. Yes? Group number one will take the lotus feet. Group number two will take 
Above the lotus feet, we've got the ankles. Is it the ankles? <laughs> the next one, the next, after the lotus feet are described, then we hear about the legs or thighs of the Lord. So that, that will be group number two, the legs or thighs. And then text 24, yeah, that's tw the thighs. Then text 25, group number three, we'll hear about the abdomen of the Lord. And then group number four will be the chest. After the abdomen comes the chest, and then meditate on the four arms. And then af after the four arms, then you should contemplate the lotus-like face of the Lord. Then after contemplating the lotus face, we should contemplate the Lord's eyes. And then the smile of the Lord, and then the laughter of the Lord, all right, that takes you up to 33. So who's group number one? Tell us about the Lord's lotus feet. The Lord's soul is depicted with distinctive lines resembling the thunderbolt, a flag, a lotus flower, and a goat. The luster of his toenails, which are brilliantly prominent, resembles the light of the moon. And if the yogi looks at the marks of the Lord's soul and on the blazing brilliance of his nails, then he can be freed from the darkness of ignorance. In the material world uh, and uh, yeah this uh, liberation is not achieved by the uh, mental speculation but by seeing the light uh, emanating from the uh, lustrous toenails of the Lord in other words one can fix his mind first on the lotus feet of the Lord if he wants to be freed from the darkness of ignorance in material existence uh-huh and, and what, are, what, what are they described? What's the spe uh, special features of the Lord's lotus feet? How to recognize them? Um, like a light, uh, I mean, uh, there is a light coming out of the nails of the Lord. That There's the light coming from where? From... Uh, I mean, the light emanated from the uh, luscious toenails of the Lord. Okay. But is it, what if the Lord is not there? How, how will we... He, I don't know. He, maybe he has slippers on. Does he wear slippers? <laughs> no, Maharaj. No. Well, in Vaikuntha, he wears slippers. In Goloka, he doesn't wear slippers. But in Vaikuntha, the Lord of Vaikuntha will have slippers on. But in Goloka, he doesn't have any slippers. So in Goloka, how did they, how did Akrua recognize the Lord? He saw the Lord's lotus footprints, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes, Lord. And what was the special features of his footprints? Uh, special features. There are different marks on his uh, footprints. Yes. Yeah. The lotus and all. Yes, yeah, all auspicious markings. There's, there's, it's nineteen different markings on his lotus feet. Auspicious yes. items are all marked there, and so Akrura somehow he he could recognize the Lord's lotus footprints. And when he came to when he came to Vrindavan, he rolled in the dust and said, "This is the dust from the footprints of my master." 
and he was taking the dust all over his body. He said, this is the dust from the lotus feet of my master. It's so wonderful. So, we're, we're inspired. And we're told also something special about the Lord's lotus feet, the, the water which washes the lotus feet. Right? Text number 22. Right? Who, holy water of Ganges. Who the takes soul. who takes the water which washes the Lord's lotus feet? Who takes that water? Lord Shiva. Where does he keep it? In his, on his head. Yes. Lord Shiva takes the Lord's foot water foot bath water on his head. Lord Shiva is the great Vaishnava, but he takes the water from the lotus feet of Krishna, places on his head. And then we're told also that the Lord's feet are like thunderbolts. Why? We destroy the mountain of sins. Yes, the mountain of sin in our heart. The thunderbolt smashes the mountain. So our mind is full of so many foolish thoughts. So, the conclusion is one should therefore meditate on the lotus feet of the Lord for a long time. Very helpful. Who meditates on the Lord's lotus feet? Lord Shiva. Or a devotee? Yeah, which devotee? What's the, the first thing he did was meditate on the Lord's lotus feet. The Vaimana Krishna Pararavinda Yoy. Who is it? Ambarish Maharaj. Yes, Ambarish Maharaj. The first thing he does, you know, Ambarish Maharaj does a lot of service. He uses all of his senses. But the first thing he's done, he fixes his mind on the lotus feet of Krishna. So very nice for us. All right, let's hear about the thighs. Who's going to tell us about the thighs? Yes? I text uh, 24, it's a description where it says that the Lord's thighs are the storehouse of energy. God's eyes are whitish blue, white blue like luster of linseed flower, and appear most graceful when the Lord is carried on the shoulders of Garuda. Mm -hmm. There's also a description in text 23. It describes that Lakshmi, the goddess of fortune, is always I'm sorry, you're breaking up there. I don't know if I have a reception problem. Okay. Can can you hear me? Hare Krishna? Yes, Maharaj, we are able to hear you. Okay. So text 23 says, Lakshmi is always found mas massaging the legs and the thighs of the transcendental Lord, very carefully serving him in this way. And so she is, the, she is the mother of the Supreme Person. She is worshipped by all the demigods and is the mother of the Supreme Person Brahma. But she is always found massaging the legs and thighs of the Supreme Lord. Okay, then, right? Okay, going ahead, text 25. We hear about the abdomen of the Lord. What are some special features about the Lord's abdomen? Some things are like Brahma, 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 the lotus, um, lotus flower. Yes, right. That's the right point. Yeah, the lotus flower, the residence of Brahma, comes from the abdomen of the Lord. Also, the abdomen is the foundation of 
I'm sorry, manager, your voice is not clear. Can you speak up and clearly? Abdomen is the um, foundation of all pancreas. Foundation of the entire universe. Okay, we'll go ahead. Then the chest of the Lord. The abode of the, the chest of the Lord is the abode of Goddess Mahalakshmi. The Lord's chest is the source of all pleasure for the mind, full of satisfaction for the eyes. The yogi should imprint on his mind the neck of the Lord. The neck of the Lord serves to enhance the beauty of the Kastuba gem which hangs on his chest. So the Lord's beauty makes the Kastuba gem more beautiful. Not that the Kastuba gem makes Krishna more beautiful, but Krishna makes the Kastuba gem more beautiful. Then 27. The yogi should meditate on the Lord for arms, the source of all power of the demigods who control the various functions of material nature. The yogi should concentrate on the polished ornaments burnished by Mandara as it revolves. He should also contemplate the Lord's discus, the Sudarsan Chakra, which contains 1,000 spokes and a dazzling luster, as well as the conch, which looks like a swan in his lotus-like palm. So these are all descriptions how we should contemplate the different limbs of the Lord. Then we hear the Lord's club, Komadaki. It's very dear to him. And it smashes the demons, so it's smeared with blood. <laughs> One should also concentrate on the nice garland on the neck of the Lord, always surrounded by bumblebees with their nice buzzing sound. And one should meditate on the pearl necklace on the Lord's neck, which is considered to represent the pure living entities who are always engaged in his service. Okay, you got that? You should meditate upon the pearl necklace on the Lord's neck. It represents the living entities, pure living entities who are engaged in his service. Then the countenance of the Lord who presents his different forms in this world out of compassion for the anxious devotees. His nose is prominent, his crystal clear cheeks are illuminated by the oscillation of his glittering alligator-shaped earrings. So alligator-shaped earrings, very complete description. What is being described? Which particular form of the Lord are we hearing about? Rupasuri. Yes, right. Thank you, Prabhu. Yes, the Paramatma is being described. The yogi meditates upon the beautiful face of the Lord, which is adorned with curly hair, decorated by lotus eyes and dancing eyebrows. A lotus surrounded by swarming bees and a pair of swimming fish would be put to shame by its elegance. Now in the material world would think that's very beautiful. A lotus flower surrounded by swarming bees and a pair of swimming fish would think, oh how nice. People draw pictures like that. but. Who, who's being described like this? The Supreme Lord. 
the Lord's face is like a lotus, and the two fish are like his two eyes, and the bees are like his curly hair. Could you please repeat? Uh, I was not able to understand properly. You said that bees are like uh, the eyes. Uh huh. Wait, said, uh, let's see. Uh, Prabhupada writes here at the end of the purport there, there are two comparisons in this verse. First, the Lord's face is compared to lotus, and then his black hair is compared to humming bees swarming around the lotus, and his two eyes are compared to two fish swimming about. A lotus flower on the water is very beautiful when surrounded by humming bees and fish. The Lord's face is self-sufficient and complete. His beauty defies the natural beauty of a lotus. Have you got it, Prabhu? Yes, Maharaj. Okay. And then, after contemplating the Lord's face, the Lord's eyes the compassionate glance frequently cast by the Lord's eyes, for they soothe the most fearful threefold agonies of his devotees. His glances, accompanied by loving smiles, are full of abundant grace. This is beautiful descriptions of Lord Krishna's eyes and how Krishna smiles at the devotees. Prabhupada writes in the purport, one cannot avoid the influence of material energy even when one is on the transcendental plane. Sometimes disturbances come, but the agonies and anxieties of the devotees are at once mitigated when they think of the Supreme Personality of Godhead in His beautiful form or the smiling face of the Lord. The Lord bestows innumerable favours upon His devotee and the greatest manifestation of His grace is His smiling face which is full of compassion for His pure devotees. So the greatest manifestation is the smile from Krishna, right? When you see Krishna, we hope he's smiling. We hope he's smiling at you. We hope he's not frowning, <laughs> right? He should be smiling. That's the blessing. And then we're told to meditate on the smile of the Lord. A smile for all those who bow to him, dries away the ocean of tears caused by intense grief. And then the eyebrows, we can meditate on the Lord's eyebrows which are manifested by his internal potency in order to charm the sex god for the good of the sages. We should read about that. <laughs> the second paragraph, it is stated in this verse that the charming eyebrows of the Lord are so fascinating that they cause one to forget the charm of sense attraction. The conditioned souls are shackled to material existence because they are captivated by the charms of sense gratification, especially sex-like. The sex god is called Makara Dwaja, the charming 
brows of the Supreme Personality of Godhead protect the sages and devotees from being charmed by material lust and sex attraction. Yamunacharya, a great Acharya, said that ever since he had seen the charming pastimes of the Lord, the charms of sex life had become abominable for him, and the mere thought of sex enjoyment would cause him to spit and turn his face. Thus, if anyone wants to be aloof from sex attraction, he must see the charming smile and fascinating eyebrows of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Okay, very important paragraph there, a lot of valuable information from Prabhupada. And then, the laughter of Lord Vishnu. The laughter is so captivating, it can easily be meditated upon. Once devoting his mind to this, the yogi should no longer desire to see anything else. You just want to see Krishna, you don't want to see anything else. All right, that's the description. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Maharaj, may I ask one question? Yes. Actually, the form of Paramatma is uh, similar to the form of Krishna because Krishna has two hands in Gola Vrindavan and in Vaikuntha he is four handed. So, it is the same form of Paramatma in Vaikuntha, it is same or different, Maharaj? The form of Paramatma is the same as Krishna and Vaikuntha. Okay, Maharaj. But, of course, it doesn't have the same power. The form of Paramatma is in the material world. He's the expansion of the expansion, right? Although the form, we said the form can be the same, but it doesn't mean he has, it all, he has all the powers of the Supreme Lord of Vaikuntha. Paramatma, well, who is Paramatma? The Lord in the heart. He's a Purusha, he's Shiro Dakashai Vishnu. Yes, Maharaj. So, like that. He's Vishnu. He's here in the material world. He doesn't go to the spiritual world. Maharaj, sorry, a quick question on that. If, if it's okay. Yeah. So, uh, the Paramatma, which is the form form, Shirod uh, Vishnu, but the devotee at one point uh, is that transformed to the form form Krishna in the heart. The devotee what? So at the moment, Shirodaksha Vishnu is the super soul in our heart. But for a devotee practicing devotional service, at what point does it, a two four arm form transform to the two arm form? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, for, for the devotee, Krishna's in the heart, right? Yes. For the devotee, Krishna's in the heart. Two-armed form. I see Krishna in the heart. At what point does that happen? I don't know. I've never had any information on that. <laughs> we can try to find that out. Interesting point. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Um, it will be appreciated. Maharaj, can I ask a question? Please? Yes. Thank you, Maharaj. Maharaj, so uh, you mean to say that Shirodaya Vishnu is Paramatma? Yes. Yes. Uh, and Krishna is in Golokna. Yes. And he is superior to uh, Shirodaya Dakshaya Vishnu. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Maharaj. Yeah. Krishna says, why I'm Bhagavan, right? 
Yes, Maharaj. And the Shri Dakshay, he's the Purusha avatar. He's from the expansion, from the expansion. From the, but Krishna is the original Supreme Lord. Yes, Maharaj. All right. So we're told, in the course of his progress of devotional service, the hairs of the body stand on end. Ecstasy, right? Constantly bathed in a stream of tears. Baba. Gradually, even the mind, which he used as a means to attract the Lord, as one attracts a fish to a hook, withdraws from material activity. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't you be happy? Your mind withdraws from material activity. Gradually, the mind withdraws from material activity because we're contemplating the Lord. We're contemplating the different limbs of the Lord. We become so absorbed that we forget about the mind. Prabhupada explains, here it is clearly mentioned that meditation, which is an action of the mind, is not the perfect stage of samadhi or absorption. In the beginning, the mind is employed in attracting the form of the Lord. But in the higher, in the higher stages, there is no question of using the mind. A, dev a devotee becomes accustomed to serving the Lord by purification of his senses. In other words, the yoga principles of meditation are required as long as one is not situated in pure devotional service. The mind is used to purify the senses, but when the senses are purified by meditation, there is no need to sit in a particular place and try to meditate upon the form of the Lord. One becomes so habituated that he automatically engages in the personal service of the Lord. When the mind forcibly is engaged upon the form of the Lord, this is called nirbija yoga or lifeless yoga. For the yogi does not automatically engage in the personal service of the Lord. But when he is constantly thinking of the Lord, that is called sabija yoga or living yoga. One has to be promoted to the platform of living yoga. Right? This is an important point, the difference, the sabija yoga and nirbija yoga. One is lifeless yoga and the other is living yoga. Sabija with life, living yoga. And so you don't, the, the, you're doing service for Krishna automatically. It's not just depending on the mind, but automatically you just think about Krishna. Okay, so the stage of Primanjana Charita can be attained by developing complete love. When love for the Supreme Lord in devotional service is fully developed, one always sees the Lord, even without artificially meditating on his form. His vision is divine. So here you are, the answer to your question, Prabhu. So when you develop love, then we'll actually see Krishna in the heart. When we have developed that complete love, then the Vishnu won't, won't be in the heart anymore. We'll see Krishna there. Okay, thank you, Maharaj. Otherwise, we're, we're meditating. We are meditate on the form of the Lord. His vision is divine because he has no other engagement. This stage of spiritual realization, it is not necessary to engage the mind artificially. The medicines and meditation recommended in the lower stages is a means to the platform of devotional service. Those already engaged in the transcendental loving service of the Lord are above such meditation. This stage of perfection is called Krishna Consciousness. 
we're trying to become devotees. Prabhupada often would often remind us, we're trying to become devotees. It's not such an easy thing to become a devotee. We're trying to become devotees. Right? Hmm. Let's go back to the PowerPoint here. Okay, here's the lotus feet of the Lord. You recognize them? Have you seen them before? Madhava. Yes, my Lord. Madhava. Madhava, yes. Okay. Someone like to read this for me? So what's easier? <laughs> Obviously, chanting. Ch children can also met, hear about the Lord's pastimes. They can hear from Srimad Bhagavatam and they can relish Lord Krishna's pastimes. Somebody else read? In this age of Kali Yuga, Lord Chaitanya has recommended that one should always engage in chanting and hearing Bhagavad Gita. The Lord also says that the Mahatmas or great souls always engage in the process of chanting the glories of the world. Just by hearing, others derive the, the same benefit. Yeah. Well, all, this, all reasons why better to chant than to just, just meditate. Okay, someone read this about the lotus feet. Importance of meditation on the Lord's lotus feet. Another significant point of this verse is that the mind of the conditioned soul, on account of its association with the material energy from time immemorial, contains heaps of dirt in the form of desires to lord it over material nature. This dirt is like a mountain, but a mountain can be shattered when hit by a thunderbolt. Meditating on the lotus feet of the Lord acts like a thunderbolt on the mountain of dirt in the mind of the yogi. 3.28.22 per part. Yeah, when we go to see Radha Madhava, we see in front of the altar, we see the Lord's lotus feet. So we are encouraged to meditate on the Lord's lotus feet. We can see the, the different markings all there on the Lord's lotus feet there in the temple in front of the deities. And the idea is we should meditate on the Lord's lotus feet and that will bring us, make us able to proper appreciate the form of the Lord. All right. Someone like to read this? Sorry, Maharaj, can I ask a question regarding the other slide? On okay. hearing and meditating on the Lord's pastimes. Okay. So, uh, on the Paramahamsa stage, Paramahamsa stage, one is constantly meditating on the pastimes of the Lord. So, at that stage, are they not chanting? Are they just meditating on the pastimes of the Lord? Obviously, the chanting brings you to that stage. Well, you never stop chanting. Even you may come to Paramahansa stage, doesn't mean you stop chanting. 
Mahatmas, it says here, Mahatmas, great thought, always engage in the process of chanting. Right? Thank you, Maharaj. Thank Ch you. Chanting is the, the means and chanting is the goal. There's nothing, you know, there's nothing after chanting. It's not that you chant to the point and then, oh, now I stop chanting because my chanting is pure. No. You keep chanting. You chant more. If your chanting is good, you'll chant more. We want to chant more. We never give up chanting. There's nothing beyond chanting. You never stop chanting. Mm -hmm. Okay, then meditation and temple worship. Please read. Chandrika, read. The most transcendental form can either be meditated upon in the mind or placed in the temple in the form of a statue and decorated in such a way that everyone can contemplate it. Temple worship, therefore, is meant for persons who are not so advanced that they can meditate upon the form of the Lord. There is no difference between constantly visiting the temple and directly seeing the transcendental form of the Lord. They are of equal value. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So all the Acharyas, they establish deities. And they also worship the deities. We see Rupa Goswami, Sanatana Goswami, they all have their deities. And they were doing deity worship. They didn't give up deity worship. They established deities. Yes? Bhakti yogis. Yogis take advantage of the process of smaranam, whereas bhakti yogis take special advantage of the process of hearing and chanting. From the purport text number 26. Yeah, hearing and chanting is the foundation of our bhakti yoga process. Of course, it, it said when we do the chanting properly, then where, where there is pure chanting, then there will also be smaranam. And sometimes Prabhupada would compare Astanga Yoga to Bhakti Yoga. He would say that the Astanga Yoga process, the, the seventh stage is dhyana, meditation. That's the seventh step, right? Prajahara, dharana, dhyana, and samadhi. So dhyana is the seventh stage. But he said in Bhakti Yoga, that dhyana, that is the third stage, smarana. So we do, we also do remembering, we also do hearing and chanting, comes naturally. Where there is pure chanting, there will also be remembering and hearing. Okay? Agonies and anxieties mitigated. As long as one is in conditional life in the material body, it is natural that he will suffer from anxieties and agonies. One cannot avoid the influence of material energy. Even when one is on the transcendental plane, sometimes disturbances come, but the agonies and anxieties of the devotees are at once mitigated when they think of the Supreme Personality of Godhead in His beautiful form or the smiling face of the Lord. Right? Who is this smiling face of the Lord here? Who is it? Lord Radha Madhav, Lord Krishna. Is it Madhav? No, Sham Sundar. Yeah, I don't think it's Madhav, yeah. So this is Radha Sham Sundar. Vrindavan. Yeah, Shamsundar. Mm, yes. Yeah. So when we see the deities, you know, we're in anxiety, we have agony. So yeah, it's natural. Just go and see the deities and chant and we'll forget them, all the anxiety. The Lord bestows innumerable favours upon his devotees 
and the greatest manifestation of his grace is his smiling face, full of compassion for his pure devotees. We read that already, yeah? But an important point. Text 32. The entire universe is full of miseries, and therefore the inhabitants of this material universe are always shedding tears out of intense grief. There is a great ocean of water made from such tears. But for one who surrenders unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the ocean of tears is at once dried up. One need only see the charming smile of the Supreme Lord. In other words, the bereavement of material existence immediately subsides when one sees the charming smile of the Lord. We just need to see Krishna's smile. I hope we can see Krishna's smile. <laughs> we have to please Krishna, we have to surrender. Mentioned here, one who surrenders, then the ocean of tears is dried up. All right? Someone like to read this final section for us, bit by bit? Lord Tapila continues to respond to Devoti in 3.27.20 about, about how the soul is bound and freed. 34. The uh, yogi's experience. One develops love of God. 35. Material mind destroyed. 36. Soul devoid of material covering. 37. Because he achieved, because he achieved his real uh, identity, he acts totally unaware of his body. 38. The body of such a liberated uh, yogi is taken charge by the Lord. 39. He understands he is different from his body. Uh, 40 to 41. Bhagavan is different from the Jiva. 42. Sees the super soul in all beings and all beings in the super soul. 43. The pure soul manifests in different bodies. 44. Conquering unsurmountable Maya, he is self realized. After conquering unsurmountable Maya, he is self realized. Thank you. Well, thank you, Manaji. So. <laughs> Self-realization. You want to be self-realized? We have to conquer Maya. So these are some of the stages. This is the stages of which the yogi goes through in the practice of this uh, Sankhya Yoga to come to the stage of self-realization. Prabhupada describes Arjuna dovetailed his mind with Krishna's desire. This is called oneness. This oneness, however, did not cause Arjuna and Krishna to lose their individualities. The Mayavadi philosophers cannot understand this. They think oneness necessitates loss of individuality. Actually, however, we find in Bhagavad Gita that individuality is not lost. When the mind is completely purified in love of Godhead, the mind becomes the mind of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So this is love, that's love of God. When, we, when we're actually in love of God, then our mind will become the mind of Krishna. In other words, we'll have no separate desire from Krishna. We'll simply desire as Krishna desires, dovetailing our mind with Krishna's desire. Okay. The yogi views his body. Someone read? Who's not read? Somebody can read? Can I read Maharaj? Yeah, please. Uh, because he has achieved his real identity, the perfectly realized soul 
has no conception of how the material body is moving or acting just as an intoxicated person cannot understand whether or not he has clothing on his body the body of such a liberated yogi along with the senses is taken charge of by the supreme personality of godhead and it functions until its destined activities are finished the liberated devotee being awake to his constitutional position and thus situated in samadhi the highest perfectional stage of yoga does not accept the by products of the material body as his own thus he considers his bodily activities to be like the activities of a body in a dream hmm. <coughs> thank you brother so the by products of the material body the byproducts is mentioned again the highest perfectional stage of yoga does not accept the byproducts of the body as his own so he, he has the yoga powers but he he's not interested he's a liberated soul he's in his constitutional position so he considers the body to be just like just like in a dream he's not even aware that he has clothing on his body we hear about atmarama self-realized souls like sukadeva goswami he was walking everywhere naked and similarly rishabdev these kind of people they were totally detached from the material body like an intoxicated person they cannot understand all right achincha beda beda tattva the blazing fire is different from the flames from the sparks and from the smoke although all are intimately connected because they are born from the same blazing wood the supreme personality of godhead who is known as param brahm param brahm is the seer he is different from the jiva soul or individual living entity who is combined with the senses five elements and consciousness so the lord is like the blazing fire and the living entity the jiva they're like sparks coming from the fire so the the living entity is not like the fire the spark is not equal to the fire and then you have the smoke also coming from the fire the smoke is like the 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 material and material elements the five elements senses so they all come from the same blazing wood everything comes from the blazing fire the supreme personality of godhead everything comes from the para brahman but there's different elements there's the senses the elements the consciousness everything is coming from para brahman just like from the fire everything's coming smoke sparks flames so from the one supreme lord everything is coming the living entities all the material energy material prakriti it's all his prakriti right so achintya beda beda tattva one and different one with the lord but different from it the lord's energy here's the illustration a yogi should see the same soul in all manifestations for all that exists is a manifestation of different energies of the supreme in this way the devotee should see all living entities without distinction that is realization of the supreme soul as fire is exhibited in different forms of wood so under different condition of the modes of material nature the pure spirit soul manifests itself in different bodies and the final verse overcoming the material energy overcoming the material energy thus the yogi can be in the self realized position after conquering the insurmountable spell of maya who presents herself as both the cause and effect of this material manifestation and is therefore 
very difficult to understand. Prabhupada explains, the external energy of the Supreme Lord is durvibhavya, very difficult to understand, very difficult to conquer. One must, however, conquer this insurmountable spell of maya. And this is possible by the grace of the Lord. For those who engage in devotional service, there is no spell of maya, and their situation is all perfect. The duty of the living entity, as part and parcel of the whole, is to render devotional service to the whole. That is the ultimate perfection of life. From the final text of chapter 28, text 44, for poor. All right, are there any questions? Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, Maharaj, yesterday you mentioned about the principal uh, yoga incarnation in the Satyu. Uh, you mentioned that there are talks of Karmajan Muni to Nimi Maharaj. Yeah. In Canto 11. I looked into it, but only the color of the uh, yoga incarnation, principal incarnation of Satyu is described as white, white color, but the name is not mentioned, though the names for uh, Treta Yoga and uh, Dwapar and Kali Yuga are mentioned separately. However, for Satyuga, I am unable to find. So, will it be possible for you to kindly help me? Yes, I'll look for him next week. Thank you, Maharaj. And our CBA will be on next Sunday, Maharaj. Sorry? Our CBA will be on next Sunday. Oh, really? No, actually, I am just asking because only one chapter is left in this unit. Yeah, but we have chapters to do. To finish the Kapila Shiksha, there's more chapters in Kapila Shiksha. Oh, I, there will be there will be one CBA for unit 13 and 14. Uh, I have to ask Padma Sundari. Yeah, because uh, then only one chapter is left in unit 13. Yes, only one chapter left, but then we have uh, four, three or four chapters there to finish the third canto. I believe that uh, if Unit 13 is getting over on Saturday, then CBA will be on Sunday. Oh, really? Uh, I don't know. I have to ask her. Okay, thank you, Maharaj. And then she will contact you and tell all of, all of you. I'll have her contact the group and, oh. and say what, thank the, you, Maharaj. what the program is. Because she, did, she didn't tell me anything and she's not here because she's sick in Chennai. Yes, her husband's supposed to be here. <laughs> but I don't, yes. I don't know. I, I, he hasn't contacted me. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Oh, you did. Communicate to her actually. Uh, she's a little bit okay, so probably tomorrow onwards she may uh, be okay. So I'll communicate to her actually. Okay, Prabhu. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Okay. Any other questions, Prabhus? Okay, then we'll we'll finish there then. And we'll see you next week. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada ki. Yes. Gorbhakta Vrinda ki.